NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is going to be a great, totally inspiring panel. I'm so happy to be a part of it. And I have to say that when I got this message from Angeline, she told me about the conference and there were a few options. And this was the panel I wanted to be on without a doubt. I said up front, if I participate, I want this panel. And I'll, I will tell you why. Um, Right now, I am at the Lauren John Arnold Foundation. We are doubling down on uh, criminal justice, advancing public safety, and the values of equity and fairness and racial justice and effectiveness. Uh, and I am thrilled to be a part of that. But in my past life, I was at the Justice Department working with the White House and all of the uh, cabinet secretaries on the Federal Interagency Reentry Council. And in that role, we had all of the agencies and all of the leadership working together to reduce collateral consequences, uh, to improve opportunities for people who had been justice involved. And we did so many things that I was proud to be a part of. There was uh, the executive, uh, the federal uh, ban the box rule, expansion of Medicaid uh, for the justice population, second chance Pell Initiative, expanding access to microloans. There were so many things I was proud of, but the best, most important thing that we did was bring on Daryl Atkinson as a second chance fellow. And he was working with us, he was working with the leadership of all of the agencies, he was working with all of the career staff on these issues and the influence that it had to change people's hearts to open their minds, uh, to really unleash their creative thinking was incredible. Um, and I would say that at first people brought him into the room because they wanted the perspective of someone who had been incarcerated to hear their direct you know, perspective and experience, but they invited him back again and again because he had the best ideas in the room. He was the most persuasive voice at the table and it was incredibly influential. And so I sit here beside three stellar lawyers. I've never met any before today. I've read and heard about all of them, and I know that their circles of influence are not only in their workspaces, but all of the concentric circles um, around them and how influential that voice is. And I think it's you know the most important voice we can bring into justice reform right now. So I'm really, really thrilled and honored to be a part of this panel. So with that, I am gonna do brief introductions. Um, I know that the Everyone here will tell their stories in the bios or in the packets, but it's, they're just incredible stories to tell. So I will give uh, just a few brief sentences and then turn it over to this amazing panel. So Jared Adams is on my right. He has recently launched his own law office uh, focusing on criminal defense and civil rights matters. But before starting his own firm, he was a post-conviction -convic litigation fellow with the Innocence Project. And I'll let Jarrett tell his remarkable story, but after release, he obtained his associate's degree, his bachelor's degree, his law degree, and then incredibly a clerk for the same Seventh Circuit that overturned his conviction and litigated the reversal of two other convictions. It's just an incredible story. And Sean Hopwood um, also has a remarkable story. He, while serving time for a bank robbery, Sean started spending time in the law library and he became an accomplished Supreme Court practitioner by the time he left in 2009. After release, he uh, earned his JD from the University of Washington School of Law and his legal scholarship has been published in all over the place, um, all the elite places. Uh, he's currently a tenure track professor of law at Georgetown Law School and he's a founding partner at prisonprofessors.com, which I totally want to hear more about. Um, and many of you have read about him. I've heard his interviews, Invisibilia, I mean, incredible stories, and can't wait to hear from him directly. And then uh, to the far right is Serena Nunn, who at the age of 19 was sentenced to almost 16 uh, months, uh, sorry, 16 years in federal prison. And after eight years, a young lawyer named Sam Sheldon read an article about Serena, 
contacted her and agreed to file a commutation petition on her behalf. And in 2000, President Clinton gave her a clemency petition and she went on to gain her bachelor's degree and her law degree. And then uh, in December, it must have been 16, 2016, President Obama uh, gave her a pardon. And I just, I read this quote, I just loved it um, from Serena who said, the commutation process was about my freedom and I think the pardon process is about my future. And uh, she's now a practicing attorney here in Atlanta and also working on initiatives to um, address criminal justice reform. So just a stellar panel here. And <laughs> this is an impossible task, but I just wanna start by asking everyone to take five or six minutes to tell a little bit about your story and if you can land on uh, when you first had a glean in your eye to think about law school and why you thought law school was a route to what came next. Do you want to start, Serena? Sure. Um. No? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Okay, so I grew up in the inner city of Minneapolis. Um, I got along pretty well with everybody in my neighborhood and at school. I loved school. I participated in a lot of school activities. I wrote for the um, school yearbook. I was involved in photography. Uh, I wrote for the school newspaper. I was a cheerleader and I won homecoming queen. After high school, a mutual friend introduced me to a guy. Um, we clicked immediately. We started dating. After a short time, it was obvious that he was a drug dealer, but I was in love and we continued to date. Uh, approximately eight months after dating, he was arrested for trying to purchase 20 kilos of cocaine, and I was arrested for aiding and abetting, and we were both tried and convicted in federal court on federal drug charges. Approximately eight years into my prison sentence, I was featured on the front page of a newspaper in an article about mandatory minimum sentencing guidelines. Um, what was interesting about that was it was my hometown newspaper and there was a the reporter his name was Joe Riggard he was doing this huge story about mandatory minimums people just didn't know about them they didn't believe that people received these lengthy draconian sentences for nonviolent drug offenses as a result of that article I received a letter from a California attorney named Sam Sheldon um, what was interesting and what surprised me was that anyone, let, that I received a letter from anyone, let alone an attorney, after being in prison for eight years because as Sean and Jared both know, the longer you're in prison, the less likely it is that anybody contacts you. So that was, that was the first thing that sort of blew my mind. And then um, what else was amazing about Sam was that he had only been a member of the bar for like two weeks when he contacted <laughs> me, right? <laughs> um, so we actually met, we discussed my case. Uh, he felt like a presidential commutation was the best route for me to go. He told me that they were one in a million. And so for whatever reason, in my heart, I felt like that was my blessing. And I felt like God had blessed me to bring Sam into my life and that I was going to receive a commutation, a presidential commutation. Um, the process, we talked about it like for maybe the first, I wanna say the first three years, um, he was helping me clear up some other legal uh, paperwork that I had submitted. Unfortunately, I was not as successful as Sean was in prison <laughs> trying to do my own legal paperwork. But nevertheless, in January of 2000, I really hit a very low point. I lost my grandmother, who I was extremely close with. Um, prior to that, I had lost two cousins. Um, who were like my brothers. And one thing I'll say is that when you go into prison, at least for me, I never would have imagined in a million years that everyone I left would not be there when I returned home. And so it was a very low point for me. Um, Sam just got this fire under him. He, he started working on my commutation in January of 2000. He garnered the support of the governor of Minnesota at that time. That's actually where my um, conviction occurred. Um, Governor Ventura wrote a letter on my behalf to President Clinton. The federal sentencing judge also wrote a letter on my behalf. Uh, the prosecutor did not object to me being released early if in fact I was gonna receive a commutation and then there were a couple other state representatives who wrote letters on my behalf. 
he submitted all of those letters. And again, like I said, I was just, I had a really low point and I was um, sort of feeling like second guessing the blessing that I thought I was supposed to get. And he filed the paperwork in March of 2000. So fast forward to July 7th, I was in a housing unit speaking with a friend of mine as she mopped the floor. And while we were talking, I was paged to report to the administration building. Initially, I was nervous because if you get paged to go to the administration building, it usually means you're in trouble or somebody's calling with bad news. And so we were like, okay, well, let's go down. And so we ended up walking down to the administration building. And when I arrived, the administrator was like, hey, are you planning on going somewhere today? And I'm thinking to myself, what is he talking about, right? And then slowly my mind started thinking about the commutation. I knew we were waiting for a response for the commutation. My heart started beating fast and then I started crying. And he was like, well, we got a call from the White House and there's a possibility that you could be leaving today. And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, if the White House contacted you, I am leaving today because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise I, I would get a letter in the mail, right? And so um, he allowed me to use the phone. I called Sam, didn't get an answer, called my mom, my sister, nobody answered. Um, the administrator was like, hey, we need you to really pack your stuff up quickly and you know get out of here because this involves the president and we don't want it to turn into a media circus. Nevertheless, um, I never thought I would find myself stalling on some level to leave the prison because I was waiting for my family or Sam to arrive to come get me. Um, but nevertheless, I packed up my things and by that time, probably every woman in the facility had heard that I was leaving. And this was after almost 11 years of being incarcerated and everyone cheered for me as I walked out the door and it was so moving, but at the same time it was very painful because there were so many people that I was leaving behind and I felt like, why did I receive this blessing and my friends are still incarcerated? And um, I walked out the door, I kissed the ground, and um, there was a prison officer who was directed to drive me to the, re the release address that I had. And lo and behold, we're on the freeway in Arizona, and we spot Sam and my mom and my sister in a limousine, a lane over. And so we all pull off, and mm -hmm. need I say, I almost climbed out of the window, but we pull off at the next exit and we all just like rushed to each other, hugged in a 7-Eleven parking lot. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was just an amazing uh, day for me, one in which I will never forget. Uh, after I was released, I went on to Arizona State to get my bachelor's degree. And then I received my law degree from the University of Michigan and um, I passed the bar in Georgia and I started working for the Public Defender's Office and I must say thank you right now to Vernon Pitts. He's the director of the Public Defender's Office. <laughs> and that's significant for me because it was very difficult for me to get employment and Vernon, you know, he just, he gave me a second chance. He gave me an opportunity to show what I could do if I worked hard. So I'm eternally grateful to him and the office. And I worked with a ton of great attorneys, um, some of whom are here today, who I could go to, Aaron, and I can't see anyone else without my glasses, but who I could lean on and go to for advice about cases and who sort of guided me through the process of being an attorney. Um, and in December of 2016, President Obama uh, pardoned my sentence. So that just brought me full circle. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you lost it? Yeah, I just a little bit, and then we'll come back okay. to you. Yeah. Um, just briefly, she asked about law school. I always had a desire to be a lawyer um, from the time I was young. However, after my incarceration, I did not believe I could become an attorney, but Sam actually did a lot of research on that and we figured out that process and that's what took place. Well, my story is similar to Jared's and, and Serena's. In fact, Jared and I do a lot of events together and I always say there's one big difference between the two of us. It's not what we look like. It's Jared was very innocent, and I was incredibly guilty. Uh, so I had to stand before a federal judge as a 23-year-old um, and be sentenced for five armed bank robberies and received a sentence of 12 years and three months. 
again, I was 23 years old, and I thought life was over for me. Uh, I remember thinking, best case scenario, I'm going to get out. I'm going to be 32, 33. I'm going to be so old. <laughs> 43, it doesn't quite feel the same. Um, but, you know, young, reckless, immature young man, that's what they think. And I went to prison and through random luck got a job in the law library. And for about the first six months there, I wanted nothing to do with the law other than handing out books to people. Those books were big, they were thick, they were intimidating. When I did pull one off the shelf, it felt like it was written in another language. Um, you know, have you ever read an ERISA opinion? <laughs> like that. I didn't think I had the capacity to do it, but then June 26 of 2000 happened and the Supreme Court of the United States that day handed down a decision called Apprende v. New Jersey, and I, along with every other person in federal prison, thought that this applied to the sentencing guidelines. Of course, I didn't know why. Uh, I mostly just wanted it to because I wanted a sentence reduction. So this launched me on a journey of two months. I prepared a habeas petition on my own behalf, sent it off to the court, and this is not a story I tell my students very often. I sent it off to the A Circuit Court of Appeals, and a few weeks later I get it back with a letter that says, Mr. Hopwood, it would really behoove you to file this brief in the correct court. And that was the start of my legal career. Uh, I was never able to get any legal relief for myself, but what I found was I kind of enjoyed solving this legal puzzle and writing out the solution. And it was challenging. The law, especially habeas law, is about the most challenging thing one could do without a bachelor's degree or a, an education from law school. Uh, and that kind of, I, I first started writing memos for other prisoners to their lawyers and eventually wrote a habeas petition or two. And then one day a friend of mine, John Fellers, came to me and said, hey, my case was just denied in the Eighth Circuit. My lawyer says I have no chance in the Supreme Court. Will you file this petition for certiorari? Nobody knew how to pronounce that in prison. Mm -hmm. I still don't to this day. Will you file a Supreme Court brief? I said, absolutely not. Uh, I didn't know a great deal about the Supreme Court, but I knew it was a lot different than filing a pro se brief in federal district court. But John was persistent. We filed this brief, and John transferred to another prison, and I largely forgot about John's case. Um, because while I didn't know a great deal about the Supreme Court, I knew the odds were so long that we really had no chance, even though I thought the issues in the case were worthy of Supreme Court review. It wasn't until I went out to the recreation yard one morning at 6.30, a friend of mine came running and screaming out of the housing unit, Sean, Sean, you know, this is federal prison. I thought, what did I say to this guy yesterday? He wants to come fight me at 6.30 in the morning. But you don't normally go to a fight with a newspaper in your hand. And what he had was a copy of the USA Today saying that the court had granted John Feller's case. How unlikely that was, given he had filed without a lawyer, had actually quoted a few of those sentences that I had pecked out on that prison typewriter. And did I have any idea of what would follow from this one case? No, but I did know it was a game changer for me in a lot of different ways. Uh, everyone wants to know, how did you rehabilitate yourself? Helping other people using the law changed my life. That was my personal rehabilitation. Uh, it also had an immediate impact because I very quickly became very popular in federal <laughs> prison. Um, and, you know, by the end, I had gotten another case granted by the Supreme Court, had won a case in the Sixth Circuit, had won cases in federal district courts all over, and by the time I left, I was working on 10 to 15 cases at once. Um, but I didn't think I could become a lawyer. I had probably around 300 lawyers say, Sean, you should get out and be a paralegal. No law school is going to accept you. Even if a law school accepts you, there is no way a bar association is going to give you a law license. And I believed them. Uh, right up to the point where I did a little bit of research of my own and ran across this name, Serena Nunn. <laughs> she got me to believe I could do it, along with a good mentor of mine who worked on the Supreme Court case, a lawyer by the name of Seth Waxman, the former Solicitor General of the United States, and my now wife. It is amazing when you have a former Solicitor General and an intelligent and beautiful woman telling you can do something, you actually start to believe it. Uh, 
And that's a problem for everyone. When you come from an environment where the message every day is implicitly and explicitly that you are garbage and it's only a matter of time before you get out and screw up again and come back to prison, any sort of positive reinforcement goes a long ways. Um, and you know, then I got out and, and there were definite challenges. Uh, I was released to the halfway house in October of 2008. Anyone remember what the economy was like? Yeah, no one was fine work, let alone the guy that just did 11 years in federal prison for robbing banks. Um, but fortunately, I had resources that some other people didn't, and my wife drove me around to lots of job interviews, and people finally said yes. And eventually, that led me to finishing my bachelor's degree and going to law school. And now, you know, when, when you introduce me as a law professor, I still get a kick out of that because <laughs> when I see students at school and they say professor, I tend to do this because <laughs> it's it's unbelievable to me, and I've been living it. Uh, what I try to do is remind people that tend to look at me as a pick yourself up by the bootstrap story, that that's not my story at all. I could have been the smartest, hardest working lawyer there was, and none of that would have mattered had people not gone out of their way to give me second chances. My story is time and time again, people went out of their way to give me a second chance when really there wasn't in it, much in it for them. Um, and so I thank you for all the work you do. I know defense lawyers don't get enough praise for the very difficult work you do, but I admire you all. Thank you. All right. Um, it's always good to see uh, Sean, and, and I most certainly um, read about Serena as well, and so it's great to, to, to meet you and, and finally uh, um, be on the panel. I, I'm always excited to meet other people who have what I call our testimonies. Like, it's, this isn't my story. Uh, I'm not that lucky. I've never won a scratch out card, none of that stuff, right? So for me to go through what I went through and be here right now, I just really feel I'm fortunate and, and it's a testimony. My story started 17 years old, um, young kid from the south side of Chicago. Um, didn't really get in much trouble. I don't have a story of I was a gang banger and turned my life around or anything like that. Pretty much stayed out of trouble, um, you know, raised by my mother, grandmother, and, and my aunts. And my grandmother was a, a lady from Jackson, Mississippi. She married my grandfather from Cleveland, Mississippi. And it was two people who shouldn't knock on that door ever. And that was the police and the school in, in her yeah. mind, OK? Yeah. Um, so I, I pretty much stuck to that um, until one night gra after graduating high school. It was the summertime. And I was on my way to college and um, just restless you know, um, anxious, didn't really know what I was going in my life at all, but I knew I was going to, to junior college in the fall. And a couple of my friends were older and they invited me to go to a party in Wisconsin, which borders the state of Illinois. And so we used the classic alibi defense, right? We, we told their parents uh, they were spending the night over my house and I told my parents I was spending the night over their house. And uh, so began the Bermuda Triangle that is Wisconsin, right? Uh, we go there, we attend a party, and we are accused of a rape that is absolutely false um, from the very beginning. And the sad situation is this. The police knew it was, and in doing an investigation, they actually withheld the statement from the one witness who could uh, corroborate our defense. And um, it took 10 years of my life to be able to prove that. I um, ended up being sentenced to serve 28 years in prison and got to prison, and uh, it was a violent incident that happened in the prison one day where everyone was locked down. And I was sold up with an old white guy named Pops. And uh, you know he worked in the law library, and you know we didn't really talk much. Um, we didn't have much in common until the one day we were on lockdown. And uh, it just so happens that the prison that I was in, you are allowed to call your fib, excuse me, your family, even, even if you are on lockdown. And I'm speaking on the phone to my mother and my aunts, and they are just, you know, confused um, about my appeal and about my case. And I'm trying to explain to them with my limited uh, Chicago public school, high school education. And after getting off the phone with them, my cellmate told me um, to, to come down from, from the top bunk. And he said, look, you know, I'm, I'm utterly confused. You know, you say you're innocent, but each and every day you get up, you go play basketball, you play chess. I mean, you don't, you don't act like you're innocent at all. You, you, to me, it looks like you think you're on a four-year uh, college campus. So he asked for all of my transcripts, 
my paperwork. And in doing so, he went through it over the course of time. Now, I was accused of sneaking up a flight of stairs, raping someone, and fleeing a building, right? There was a witness in there named Sean Demaine, and it was a guy that we were playing video games with throughout the entire night. So essentially, he was our alibi. There was a statement in there, which really wasn't a statement. It was really like three sentences. He basically said, yeah, I saw these guys. They were here. They were there. And my cellmate said, look, who is this guy? And it wasn't until then that it jogged back my memory of what I was doing. All I, as, as a 17, 18-year-old, I'm accused of a rape. All I know how to do is say I didn't do it. I wasn't thinking how to put things into place and how to defend myself like a lawyer um, because I wasn't a lawyer. So after contacting um, an attorney and, and getting an investigation going to go and contact this witness, the witness was like, look, I'm not sure what else you want from me. You know, I gave you guys a three-page statement. And the investigator's like, no, nah, we don't have a three-page statement from you. So it was then that we found out that the police, quote unquote, mistakenly, forgot to turn over this statement, which um, resulted in me having my habeas petition uh, granted in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, this is great. I'm released. But this took 10 years of my life. And more importantly, to answer your question about why did I go to law school, there was a woman who sat in, the, in, in a row behind me. And I never forgot the wrinkles and creases of anguish that lined on her forehead. And that was my mother. And she felt like it was her fault because she couldn't afford me an attorney. I was appointing an attorney off the panel list who decided to go with a, get this, brace yourself now, a no defense theory. And his no defense theory was basically it's a baseless accusation. They didn't do it. They're going to find you not guilty. Well, no, not in a town called Jefferson, Wisconsin, where, um, you know, the, the only black people are working on the side of the roads, right? That's not the, the case, and that's not what happened. So in coming home, I was in debt. Because if my mother could put in 10 years of investing and believing in me, I most certainly was going to return her back to her favorite seat in church in the front row. I Thank you all. I, I got out and it was a, it was a huge struggle. Um, I often share this and I'm increasingly more sharing this in my story. Um, I needed to, to talk to someone. I needed some help. But in a black community, especially mental health care is, is like a dirty word um, for whatever reason. So my mother and my aunts tricked me with my favorite um, lure, which was a dinner on a Sunday. And I came over there and they were all sitting there and they're like, look, baby, um, in their exact words, uh, we're pissed off. So we, we don't understand why you're not mad and we think you need to talk. See, I was on autopilot and I knew that my emotions triggered their emotions and I didn't want them to have any more emotions dealing with me um, after 10 years of dealing with me. So I finally got the mental health care that, that I desperately needed. And from that couch in my mother's living room, I walked down road into South Suburban Community College I graduated at the top of my class. They did a feature on me in the Sun-Times in Chicago. And a, and, a, and a lady reached out to me, who was the director of the Federal Public Defender's Office of Chicago. Her name was Carol Brooke. She gave me a job as a full-time investigator um, and really set the track for me to go to, to law school. I worked there full-time. Um, I graduated from undergrad uh, while working there. I you know, applied for the Chicago Bar Foundation and I was granted. Uh, the, the award of $40,000 to attend law school. I got accepted into a, a, a number of different law schools, but it really came down to money. And so I took uh, Loyola Law School, where I graduated in 2015 in Chicago. After graduating from there, uh, I did a dual clerkship in the Seventh Circuit uh, with Judge Ann Claire Williams, who is now retired, and then also in the Southern District of New York. You know, I had these lofty visions and goals of uh, I'm gonna take this bar, that bar. After the New York bar, I didn't want a candy bar. I was like, <laughs> this is this is it for me. I'm pro hocking in everywhere, right? So um, I, I took, I passed the New York bar and I had the amazing opportunity to, to come full circle and to work with the Innocence Project. Um, and, and I did so, and, and, and as my testimony continues to grow, I was a part of a defense team that overturned a conviction of a guy in Wisconsin that I often saw in a law library. And my co-counsel was none other than Keith Finley, who argued my conviction in the Seventh Circuit and got my conviction reversed. 
And so that's what I'm telling you. This is a testimony, man. Like I, I don't even go to casinos, okay? I don't win. So I know this is, this is for a, a reason. I recently opened up my firm and I am working on a, a couple different cases, um, one of which that is gonna be featured soon in, in Virginia. Um, I'm doing wrongful conviction work and I'm also doing civil work. So I try to answer and respond to as many people as possible. Um, I remember graduating and, and after they mailed me my diploma, I took it to my mother and I was like, look, you know, I really felt, you know, elated to be able to handle that. And with tears in her eyes, she told me, she said, look, I'm not crying because I'm, I'm, I'm sad. I'm crying because I know that you will have the opportunity to keep another young mother and her son from experience what you experienced. So that's why I did what I did. So I'm going to ask a couple more questions, this incredible panel, but get your questions ready because we're going to open up soon for um, Q&A. So the theme of this conference is collateral consequences. So can you talk about um, structural or other barriers to both applying or getting your law license? We've heard some of the ways you've navigated that, but if there are particular either uh, people, programs, other ways that help uh, navigate and clear the way that would be useful for other people thinking about this path. That would be helpful. Anyone want to start? I, you know, I, what I what I think we we need is this. We we need to continue to to duplicate. Um, you know, Sean, Serena, um, as much as possible. Because when you think about a situation as big as the criminal justice system and the problems that we have, um, it takes the people who've experienced it and walked through it. Um, just like how you mentioned with Daryl, you know, and, and, and what he brought to the table. And it's, it's important. I mean, it's important because, um, you, you know, essentially we are, we are displacing people and, and at a ridiculous rate. And it's not on accident. All of these things can be uh, brought back to one thing, and that's, that's money, right? Um, prisons are a huge cash cow, uh, flip-flops. Uh, toothpaste, can't you name it, right? The, the, the phone companies, billion dollar phone companies. So in essence, what we need is we need to, to increase the duplication. And the only way we do that is by having um, more role models, more attorneys who take on uh, a, a Serena, a, a Sean. Um, we all have to do pro bono hours, right? At a certain, certain point. And I think that tackling you know certain stuff in the criminal justice system would be the best way to do it. I struggle to even go get an ID. I don't know about you guys, but like, I, you know, so it's stuff like that, that's simple, but um, a big hurdle. I think for me, I think part of the application process when you're talking about law school or even employment, I always wanted to be able to get in front of the person who was making the decision because I wanted them to be able to see past my crime and see me. And just like sort of piggyback off of what Jared is saying, it's important for when with technology today, everything that you do is online, right? So everything is impersonal. You don't get the opportunity to be able to humanize um, the person or the situation. And I think that that's one of the huge obstacles that I think formerly incarcerated people have to deal with. And it happens in every aspect of life, you know, where you're talking about employment, education, you know, housing, and any other type of assistance. It's not just, you're not able to sort of get in front of the person to explain your situation. That's why I think the ban, the ban the box initiatives, they're important because if you do not have to discuss the crime, right, that you were convicted of until you get called in for the interview. That makes a huge difference because now you have another human being in front of you um, who you can explain to them what happened when you're thinking about being 23 or, Jerry, you were 17, I was 19. We, we have all been there um, as human beings. When you're young, you don't make the best decisions sometimes. You just don't. And so I think for me, that was one of the, the biggest obstacles was um, not being able to, or I always push to speak with the person directly. I, I didn't know that this was gonna be an issue I worked on, um, and it has in the last year. I, I uh, had a good friend who formerly incarcerated, um, had just the most horrific childhood you could imagine. Parents addicted to drugs, committing 
robberies with her in the back seat as a little kid. She's homeless at 13, uh, pregnant at 14, 20 years of in and out of prison, and just real struggle. Her name's Tara Simmons. And then eventually she turns her life around. And when she comes out of prison the second time, she gets help for all of the untreated trauma from sexual assaults, and she gets help for the drug addiction. And she decides she wants to go to law school, and I help her apply. She gets accepted to Seattle U, and she just takes off. She uh, did five public service internships. She was awarded the Graduating Student Award for the entire law school, the Dean's Award for the entire university. She's appointed to two commissions by the governor of Washington. She graduates with honors, and then she goes to apply to the bar, same bar, Washington State, mind you, that let me in. She goes to apply, she has 50 members of the bar that write letters of recommendation, three state court judges, and the prosecutor of King County. And then the bar denied her six to three. That's when I got involved with the case. Uh, the process is, that's a recommendation, it goes up to the Washington Supreme Court, you file a one-page notice of appeal, but what we found was the rules didn't say what the one-page notice of appeal looked like. So we filed a 16-page notice of appeal that looked an awful lot like uh, an opening brief. And to our surprise, the Washington Supreme Court for the first time in 37 years granted full review. And I argued the case in November. And, and basically the thrust of the argument was, listen, people change, character's not static, and the law needs to recognize that. I go from the argument straight to the airport and I'm on a plane home when I get a text from my wife and says, Tara just called, left a message and said, we won. I said, that's not possible. Uh, Supreme Court do not issue same day decisions. And as with so many things in my life, I was wrong. Uh, two hours after the oral argument, the court entered a unanimous decision saying Tara Simmons had the character and fitness necessary to practice law. She took the bar exam in February the opinion came out in April, again, unanimous opinion, written by Justice Mary Yu that basically said, listen, the profession has used the character and fitness test to keep out women and people of different colors and people of different nationalities and people with different political beliefs and people with different sexual orientations and enough is enough. Uh, and then I went back to Seattle in June and watched Tara Simmons get sworn in as a lawyer, as three of the Washington Supreme Court justices were in attendance that day. Uh, and, and since then, you know, I, I'm mentoring about 20 to 25 people at any given time who have serious felony convictions who are either on their way to law school, in law school, or recently graduated law school. And it's just really amazing to watch because the profession just needs that perspective. Uh, and we're doing all sorts of things. So I'm representing other people. Uh, I'm working with Stanford Law School, who has started a free clinic to provide representation for people with prior criminal backgrounds who are applying to become lawyers. I am working with law school students from four different schools. We're trying to get the ABA to change a rule through the student division about how the ABA what the ABA says about character and fitness decisions. And I think you're gonna see movement in part because the criminal justice got, system got so big and impacted so many more people. And a lot of those people are coming home and wanna do this work as a lawyer. And so I think you're gonna see more people like us in panels all over because uh, if I have it my way, I'm gonna have an army of justice advocates here in a few years. <laughs> Uh, driving one day and happened to catch randomly a bit of that podcast. Was it Invisibilia? Invisibilia on NPR. And I was riveted, and I actually had spoken to, to Tara about other things and then heard this and, and put it together and found that and listened to the podcast. So anyone who's interested in the story should listen to it because it's um, fantastic and deep in so many ways, and they framed it around patterns and uh, how much do past predict future. And um, so one of my questions is, how much do you think that your voice and your past and then showing who you are now and the role you're taking influenced their decision in that case? And then I just want to open up to all three of you of your role as being justice involved in your past 
how that influences both the cases you take and the justice reform work that you're doing? I don't, I don't know how much of an impact my story has on other people. What I would say is I try to, well, part of the reason I wanted to clerk after law school and I clerked at the D.C. Circuit, none of those judges had ever been around someone who'd actually gone to prison. And, you know, I try to be around people that have never experienced the criminal justice system, have no family members or friends who have, in part because when they see people who have, it tends to change their views mm -hmm. about what people are capable of. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the things I do is cultural change. You know, we can't expect to get mass incarceration and political change to happen overnight until we start convincing policymakers that, again, character is not static and people change. And we want to encourage them. And why would we want to close the door on them and close them out of this profession? Um, I think that for me, the way that I've been able to contribute, and I'm, I'm like Sean, I don't know what sort of impact my story has on people. I know that I've done... <laughs> I know that I've done a ton of um, public speaking, and a lot of it is um, to young girls, 13 to 18, or to at-risk youth. And I try to share my story so that they can think about some of the decisions that they're making so that they're not um, finding themselves going down this road, and maybe it will inspire them to share that my experience with others and influence them in their decision-making. But what I'll also say is um, when I worked at the public defender's office, for me, interacting with my clients, my experience helped me to relate to my clients better. I think I was able to build a strong rapport with my clients, and that in turn helped me to represent them better. It's very difficult, um, you know, and I, I think a lot of times public defenders, we just don't get the the, um, I guess, accolades that we deserve, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn or any of the other lawyers in the office, but I know that the lawyers in the public defender's office work extremely hard. And it's important to the culture, at least in the public defender's office down here, that you practice client-centered representation. And for me, again, my experience, I believe, helped me to be able to relate to my clients in addition to be able to interpret their stories to the court and to humanize them before the judge. Because otherwise, the number of cases that the attorneys deal with in our office or my, in my former office, people can become numbers. And you have a lot of the other, uh, you know, maybe some judges or the prosecutors, they just become callous. And they don't see the individual that's before them and that this is somebody's life, this is their story. So I think for me, a lot of um, the way that I've been able to influence in some respect is to be able to build a, a close rapport with my clients to offer better client-centered representation and to translate their stories. Yeah, I mean, I look, judges holler at me just as loud as regular lawyers, right, without backgrounds. <laughs> but um, I think that I most certainly, um, you know, am able to, to relate with families on a whole nother level. Um, because some lawyers feel like, look, it's after they are retained, like they don't have to talk to the family, right? They just right. talk with the client. But I make it my point to, to talk with family because I know uh, for a fact that uh, family is incarcerated too, just minus the bars. Absolutely. And so I make it my, my point to, to really um, update families and, you know, speak to, to girlfriends, mothers, you know, you name it. Um, I, think, I think that... Well, I do, I do a lot of speaking as well to, to teenagers, especially in Chicago, where I'm from. Um, and just the real reality is, even the science backs this up, uh, teenagers are some of the dumbest species on earth, all right? <laughs> and so, but what we can't do is, we, we can't get in the habit of throwing away people. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's essentially what we are doing um, with the criminal justice system. We had a war on drugs, it resulted in mass incarceration. So now we need to have a war on resources, a war on education, and hopefully it can result in mass educated folks, mass folks who have opportunities and stuff like that. So I, I make it my, my point to do um, uh, expungement summits in, in Chicago, or I even sit myself and do the applications and stuff like that. I want people to understand and know that like I'm not a magic trick. I'm, I'm real and, and, and I haven't been ever compensated any money. I did this 
um, and, and, and stuck to it, and, and so can you. And so the only way to do that is to, to continue to, to walk in and show people. So um, I, I really feel like some of the best coaches in basketball or any game have been players themselves, right? So I'm waiting to see when Sean um, is hired as uh, the head of the Department of Justice one day. That's you know, right. That's Serena. right. That's so I, 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 uh, I want to be director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> for sure. In this arena, you all are rock stars, right, in the criminal justice uh, reform arena. In your day-to-day -day practice, is it something that's part of uh, your kind of your profile and that your colleagues and, and judges and others are aware of or only when it's relevant in the I think it, yeah I think it yes I think it's both I think um, in my in in the public defender's office I believe everyone pretty much knew my story um, I have some I've had some clients who said something to me you know during the representation I didn't always like tell my client hey you know this is what happened but I always had that sort of passion I think that came through that I tried to represent them in the way that I know that I wanted to be represented. Um, and in some instances, yes, I would share it with, with certain individuals, but like he's, like Jared said, Google is everything. I mean, they just, people look you up and you know, so. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm an anomaly in the legal academy for sure. And I, don't think I walk around very often where people don't know my story, especially after this past year because of 60 Minutes. The first time that aired, 13.4 million people watched it. It <laughs> freaks me out every day thinking about it. And honestly, I, I get uncomfortable with the attention. But the reason I don't shy away from it is I'm in contact with thousands of people in federal prison and their families. And I know they don't have a voice. And they beg and say, Sean, you have to go do these things. So I do a whole lot of public speaking that I tell you I wish I didn't have to, and my wife and kids wish I didn't have to and wasn't always working as much as I do, but I feel compelled to do it. Uh, not just because I like it, but because I know there are people currently struggling in prison that don't have much of a voice. And this is also why I am, you'll see me making a lot of push both in scholarship and social media and other places to get more criminal justice reform organizations and more people that do this work to hire formerly incarcerated people in leadership and policy positions because we do bring something unique to the table and we bring a perspective that even very well-meaning people may not initially see because they're not thinking as someone who has been to prison. And so I'm hopeful that, that you know, you will see more formerly incarcerated lawyers and advocates all over the place doing this work. And it won't just be the three of us and a handful of other people that get to go to these panels all the time. You'll see more and more people bring this perspective. And again, I think that that's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I think it's a part of the, the job, like, you know, to share my testimony, to talk to others, like I said before, to encourage, especially, like I said, we, we, we um, the narrative of young black men must change in America if, if we're going to have real change. Um, of the 2.3 million people incarcerated, about 700,000 are, are black men. Um, and that, that, you know, really came into realization, you know, when I was in prison. Um, I used to play basketball a lot, and everyone in prison has a nickname, right? So it was a couple guys, and they were referring to each other as like Pops, Old Man, Grandson. It wasn't until I was on a visit with my family that I realized that this was a grandfather, a father, and a son, all in one prison. And it, it really didn't hit home until after the, the visit ended, when they tell everyone to stand up. Um, the prisoners go to one side of the, the, the room to get let back in the population. The family goes to the other side. Each of those ladies had a toddler in tow. And I couldn't help but to look at that and say to myself, you know, will they grow to reach their potential or be their father's and grandfather's replacement? And, and to look at that and to come out here and do what I'm doing now, um, I bugged the mess out of Angeline, like seriously, trying to, trying to make sure that I got an opportunity because because this is more so like my coming out party. I got out in 2007 and in you know, 10 years, 
I had to do a lot of work, like seriously. So I never really got the opportunity to take on speaking events and stuff like that. So I am doing a whole lot of stuff. I am launching a video series um, and with a little hip twist to it to gauge, engage the young generation about knowing your rights and stuff like that. It is, it is our responsibility. It is our duty um, to make sure that the next generation is ready. Um, and we can't keep losing them to traffic stops. Like, we can't, it's unacceptable. So um, to answer your question, I, I, um, it's, it's my duty, like it really is. Um, I can't shy away from it. And then when I go to church with my mother, everybody know, like it ain't no hiding, okay? She is walking through with this big old hat on and just coming through the, 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 the doors of the church and now all, uh, open, she swing me down there with her. So it's like everyone knows, but she, she deserves that, you know? So um, I'm open with mine. And like I said, I don't, you know, judges and, and clerks and stuff like that, they will Google, they know who I am before I, I walk in. So um, it has helped in, in, in some ways. And like I, get, like I said, it's just, it's our responsibility and duty to do it. Um, it's our responsibility. I mean, I recently filed a commutation on behalf of my brother who's been incarcerated for 23 years in the state of Minnesota. And um, I did that not just for the love of my brother, but that I feel obligated. I feel obligated as um, a person who has to have a voice for so many other people who are still incarcerated. And I agree with Jared when we're talking about the narrative of black men. And I mean, I've watched my brother um, not be in the lives physically of his four children, as they're all adults, graduated from high school, went on to have professions. But I agree that we are obligated. And along with what Sean said, it's important for us to mentor and strive to help more formerly incarcerated individuals who do want to become members of the bar, because that's how we will branch out and be able to have more people helping people incarcerated and hopefully less people incarcerated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I, and I think me and Sean, we, we talked about this a lot. Um, Reentry is, is like hugely important, but it can't start like when a person gets out. You, you know what I mean? Because you think about when people jump out of planes, like they have their, all that gear on, you know, the, 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 uh, the parachute. They don't have that on for jumping out the plane. They have that on for making sure that they land. So, and you, if you look at reentry, if it doesn't start until, what do they give you programs? One year before you're getting ready to get out right. or something like that? Maybe, So if it, if it doesn't start until then, like how on earth, you know, will it be successful? In the end, people reenter back into the same communities that they were displaced from and incarcerated from. So we are essentially making victims out of those communities by putting people back into these communities who are ill prepared mm -hmm. to, to do anything. So um, I, 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 it's, it's our duty, it's our responsibility. Wow, you guys. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in a really privileged position as a law professor, and, and I feel the weight of being formerly incarcerated. I'll just give you one quick example, and this isn't gonna make me popular in the room, but it needs to be said anyway. Uh, formerly incarcerated people, having them in your organization, again, will give you a different view of things. And I'll tell you, there are a lot of people in prison and their families who know about this event, saw what the subject matter was, and then I got a lot of emails in the last two weeks, and I'll tell you what those emails said. Again, this is not to be critical of anyone. I love NACTL. I've been a member of NACTL since I was in law school, but these emails, you know what they said? Why is Sally Yates being given an award considering she single-handedly killed 3,000 clemency petitions when she worked for DOJ? She testified against sentencing reform both at the Congress and the Sentencing Commission. And when people in prison see that, they don't understand. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, this is why I, you know, somebody has to say it. But I got lots of emails in the last couple of weeks from people in prison and their families asking, why were they doing this? Uh, and again, it's not to be, I love NACTL, but I think if 
formerly incarcerated people had more were spread around in all of these criminal justice organizations. I see it everywhere. I think a lot of things would change and be different. Uh, and you know, I wouldn't have thought about that either. I had gotten a word with Sally Yates just a couple months ago in D.C. and didn't think nothing of it. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just as bad. But I'll tell you, people notice those things, and the whole community needs to understand and uh, that perspective. Uh, and that's why it's so necessary and so needed. I'm not going to touch that one, but I am. I do want to open it up, open up the mic for other questions, comments for this amazing panel. And if you can start with your name and your organization, and then the question, please. Good afternoon. I'm Carrie Howard. I'm the public defender in Palm Beach County. Uh, I just want to quickly say thank you for your work on behalf of lawyers. I have hired a number of lawyers. And it is a bitch getting them into the bar. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to keep that up, but it does, it is going to take support from other lawyers. We can't represent them in that process. So I say that to other lawyers out there. Volunteer to help young lawyers trying to get into the bar who are wanting to do um, public defender work and other public interest work. Um, I'm interested in the mental health needs upon release and what does work, what doesn't work. We're also very involved in reentry, and I think that is an area that we are not properly addressing. So I would be interested in your um, thoughts about the mental health needs upon release and what is good treatment. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, um, I'm gonna give you my information too. So I'm actually uh, doing some, some stuff uh, with, with NYU on trying to bridge the gap between criminal justice and you know, um, healthcare because look, it's it's not post traumatic; it's persistent traumatic stress. Um, that's what it is because it doesn't stop. So nothing is is ever you know having an opportunity to be post. And so, if you can just think about this, let's say you get up in the middle of the night and you stub your toe on the way to the bathroom. I bet you when you get up in the middle of the night from that point on, you're gonna remember about hitting your toe and be more careful, right? So just imagine what people who go through prison um, have to have to like shake off after years and years and years. Um, so you are housed in animal-like conditions. Um, a lot of the ways fed like an animal with the food, and then you're released after decades and you're told to be human. That doesn't make sense at all. And so um, I am going to increase my voice of. I'm not a magic trick. I got here because I got here because I was open and receptive to therapy and stuff like that. So I'm gonna use testimonies from other people and try to get other people to open up as well. And I'm hoping that what I do is um, start the, the field of uh, mental health care providers to doing some pro bono work for people who are reentering. It must be, it, it, you look, if you are going to see your parole officer, um, you most certainly should be going to go see someone else uh, to help you uh, with dealing with, with, with reentering back into society. So. Uh, I, I, I work with lots of formerly incarcerated people. I can tell you across the board, anyone who served more than a few years comes out with trauma, uh, untreated trauma. I didn't realize about that about myself, um, but boy, if you ask my wife, she would tell you the first two, three years that I got out of prison, that there was a lot of untreated trauma there. And, and you know, it happens for various reasons, because of the bad conditions, but, you know, in prison, when you get into confrontation, there's no de-escalation. <laughs> there's none. You get back up in their face, you yell. Well, it turns out that doesn't work very well in a marriage, as my wife could attest. And, and so I see people that are formerly incarcerated all the time that have issues that they're probably not even thinking about, but they are all have trauma, and some of them have PTSD. You know, I clerked at the D.C. Circuit, and I just remember one day walking through, and I heard a rattle. It was a U.S. Marshal carrying a bunch of chains and shackles, and I about lost it right there in the middle of the courtroom. It took me back to prison that quick. Uh, and you're right, we, we've got to figure out a way to get people the help they need when they get out, and also why they're in. Yeah. And I think um, just 
I mean, in terms of counseling, like I didn't think that I needed any counseling, but the probation officer that I had, he made that a requirement. And once I went through counseling, I appreciated it because like Sean said, there's certain things that just take you back right away. I can be anywhere. If I hear keys, I can detect keys like a mile away because that just represents an officer walking somewhere or long lines. I didn't realize how I responded to long lines. I am extremely impatient, but that comes from being in, in a state prison may be a little different, but I know Sean knows the lines are extremely long. I mean, there's all sorts of small triggers. And with my family, I think the first couple of years, every time I would respond to something, they would be like, well, why are you getting mad? And I'm like, I'm not mad, but now I'm mad because you think I'm mad, right? But <laughs> It's just the way I would respond and I didn't realize it took time to bring that down. And then there's the, um, for me, I know that there was a huge um, embarrassment issue that I had and I felt shame and I never wanted anybody to know that I was in prison even though I had done interviews, but that was like the media stuff. But in my day-to-day -day life, I just, I would like lose it. I didn't want people to know that I had been to prison because I, walked around with this this shame, you know? Um, just tons of things, but I think counseling, and I mean, I don't think it hurts to suggest it to your clients or to, you know, any, to the clients that you have, that they should experience or test out any counseling. And on this one, I think there's more to share, so maybe after the session too, we can connect mm -hmm. with you in the back. Great. All right, thank you, Ponchellis Jackson, uh, Uplifting People. I thank you all for your uh, testimonies and experiences you went through. Uh, for myself, I was, ser I was sentenced to 30 to serve 15 here in Georgia for drug trafficking. Um, of course, mandatory minimum sentencing based on the amount that I had. Wasn't eligible for parole until serving a third of that, which was five years. But I was made to serve an additional one year, one month, and 11 days for having a cell phone and meeting my lady on detail. Um, while doing that, um, I was granted first offender status because I did my research while in county jail and, and found out about first offenders and requested it and the judge granted it based on my background and education and things of that nature. Um, while doing time, I spoke to various inmates about probation and parole, things like that. And most people don't know that they can be terminated from supervision after serving 24 months because they don't do the research, but I did. I petitioned for termination, was granted, and now have all of my rights restored and voted for the first time in life. That's all right. For me, what all what you all have just said touched me because my wife often tells me that I need to go back to school and study law, but my background was actually engineering, chemistry. Mm -hmm. I currently work in that field and my question is, in doing so, if I was to attempt to or want to go back to school, how would I do that and balance still taking care of my family? So when Night. you do go back to school, um, <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can do it like, look, I was in school with a, with, a, uh, with a doctor, and this lady would come to school at night in scrubs from working our first shift delivering babies, right? I was also in school with a lady who was visually impaired and she would read through the bubbles on the book. Um, I was in law school myself. I worked full time and couldn't get all of the, the student loan money that everybody else got. I hate it when I saw people with that Starbucks cup, I would knock it over, because I, I couldn't afford it, right? You know what I'm saying? That type of stuff, right? I would bring Folgers Crystal in a Ziploc bag, right? So you have to understand in, in your mind, right? There's something on the other side of a barrier right now, right? And that barrier is doubt. No matter what you have to do, you have to commit yourself to doing it. It is better to fail trying than to not try at all. And if you, whenever you're ready, I got LSAT uh, books. Y'all still, y'all still got that stuff too? I got LSAT books, law school, whatever it is. I tell you, focus on the logic games. They stupid. They have nothing to do with law school, but um, focus on them because that's where all your money is. All right. You're going to know the answer to that. The other stuff that pick, 
two to one is the best answer, all that, that's crazy. But commit yourself to doing it, right? Whatever it is, like if it's something in your life that you can't live without, imagine it being on the other side of a barrier. And you're gonna, no matter what you're gonna do, you can't be without it, right? So you're gonna go over it, go around it, or go right through it, but you're gonna keep going. And that's what you have to do with your education and what you wanna do in life. And I can't answer the balance question. Uh, I work way too much uh, to the detriment of a whole lot of other things. But I will tell you, if you do decide to go back to law school, it's now easier for people with our backgrounds than it ever has been before. Again, I know 20, 25 people who are in law schools from Yale to wherever who are currently in law school now with serious felony convictions. And, and I'm working with LSAC. I, I gave a talk to uh, 500 admissions officers in June for law schools and basically told my story, told Serena's story, told Tara Simmons' story, and just told them, you have to give people holistic review and understand that people have the capacity to change. Let them in law school. And I think, I think uh, you will not have a problem getting accepted to law school. I really believe that. I'm gonna give you my email address. I'm serious. I just pulled up the Google Drive with the, uh, with the LSAT stuff for you. I can talk to you after the conference, but John Marshall Law School here in Georgia, you, you reside here in, in yeah, they have um, night school. And I have a friend who has a family. She worked at a law firm. Um, she doesn't have the same background as us, but that's not important right now. You wanna know about how you can balance um, your life working and, and going to school. She went to night school for five years and she graduated from John Marshall. She has her own practice, she's doing well. So it can be done. And if you want, I could provide you with some information once the conference is over. Luck, exciting. Let's do this, let's do two questions. We'll put two questions on the table and then we'll do a round and get another round of questions. Dr. Pryor. Good afternoon. Hey, Amy. Hey. Mm -hmm. So uh, my name is Dr. Divine Pryor. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions which is the nation's first and only criminal justice research policy advocacy and training center developed, designed, and run by formerly incarcerated professionals representing mm -hmm. every discipline from law to medicine. In that regard, let me welcome you to the Army. You guys got me excited. I almost mm -hmm. wanted to jump out of my seat. I got three new ones. Jared, you were already on my short list already. Uh, so uh, you in New York. But the question I want to ask, and it kind of dovetails off the mental health question, how often do you actually go back into the prison? How do you give back to those in prison? And what impact does it have on you when you do that? I'm 30 years removed uh, from prison, but each time I go back, there's an experience I have to undergo. I want to know what your experience in that process is. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm let's gonna... do this. Let's get one more question oh, on the table right. and then we can respond to right. you. Thank Good. you. My name is Jody Polk. I was a certified law clerk when I served my time in prison. I'm now a 2018 Soros Fellow and I'm working to redevelop law clerk programs in prisons throughout the United States, as well as look at the training of how we train law clerks inside of the institution and build a network so that when they are released, we don't have to do so much you know, to be able to get to where we're at. It's been four years now since my release and I'm still fighting, you know, to get into law school. Mm -hmm. So when you hear stories like this, it's hope. But then when you kind of go home, it's that reality mm -hmm. of, you know, how do we overcome these barriers? And so the gentleman before me asked one of my questions, like this is great engaging criminal defense attorneys and, you know, um, organizers and organizations, but how do we actually engage those law clerks? Um, Jared, you talked about this has to happen while we're incarcerated, not after we get out. There's a law library in a federal prison, a state prison, a mm -hmm. men's prison, and a woman prison. These individuals are already identified. They're already in these spaces. So how do you plan to or do you do or can we actually put the focus on these individuals so you don't have to come home, then go through children, family? We can create the balance before. So we don't have to focus on the balance afterwards. And then also my question was, um, now that you're all attorneys, what resources do you see or you use now that you wish or should have been available in the law libraries and the institutions where you were? Thanks. 
it's probably case we'll do some law. quick rounds yeah, of okay. answers and get some more questions on the table. <laughs> if I could address the gentleman that asked about um, going into the prisons or what we've done since then. Uh, I actually went into Stillwater Prison in Minnesota. I was invited by the education department um, to come speak at their black history program. And um, the response was overwhelming with the men who were incarcerated. A lot of them were long timers. Um, I also invited a childhood friend of mine who started a father's project. He was a single father when we were children and he's gone on to do some amazing things. And so um, both of us together being in there worked well with the men that we were speaking to. But um, I've also done, uh, just in going in the jail system here, Fulton County Jail, when I was working in the public defender's office, there's a lot of, um, it was required for us to go in there to speak to our clients and things like that. Um, were, were there, was there something more specific? Did you wanna know the effect or the impact on us in going in those places? Yes, yes. Um, when you go inside, I'm sure something physiological and I, I, I heard him, he said something physiological that happens, and you're right. For me, when I went, the first time I went into Fulton County Jail, the smell of the linen the washing, the what they use to clean like the uniforms and that, that just sort of took me right back and I had to stop for a moment and take a deep breath. Um, and what's interesting about that is our director at the Public Defender's Office had asked me, are you gonna be okay when you go in there? So I also thank him for just being aware and thinking of those things to say, hey, before you go in there, you know, I'm gonna consider where you've been, but it was okay, I, I had that deep breath. Again, the key situation came up because your ear is tuned to hear keys. Um, and I think going into the prison um, where my brother is incarcerated, that one was just a little bit more emotional. And it was, um, it was emotional because I primarily saw all black men. Mm -hmm. And that just made me think of how many of our people are incarcerated. And it, that saddened me, but again, those are some of the, I hope I answered some of what you were looking for. Right. I, uh, I, I go into the prisons about every three months, uh, various prisons, both to study as a scholar, but I wanna be grounded in that because those are the people I care about and those are the people I'm thinking about when I'm making policy decisions. And one of the things I'm really excited about this fall is I'm teaching my, for the second time, a class, Prison Law and Policy. And I'm gonna take 70 Georgetown Law School students into the maximum security prison at USP Hazleton in West Virginia and expose these students to what a real prison looks like. Uh, and I, uh, I, you know, I'm really excited about that because my students are going to go off to be criminal defense lawyers. Some of them are going to go off to be prosecutors. Some of them are going to go be corporate lawyers. But having been inside a prison and see what it's really like, I think will really impact them and their career going forward. Yeah, I, I, I'm in prison visiting clients like two, three times a month, actually. So I'm. Um, I am uh, in the mentor program, the uh, CGA panel and, and CJA panel in the Southern District of New York. So I'm often in, you know, seeing my clients and stuff like that. And uh, I got the experience like really early on because when I was an investigator at the Federal Public Defender's Office going through school, you know, I would have to go and visit people in a the, in the correctional facility and stuff like that. Um, it doesn't really, you know, I've, I've been able to, to, to compartmentalize you know, emotion like that, right? So it doesn't anger or upset me, it drives me to continue to do what I'm doing because exactly what Serena said, I mean, to look in the pods and and to see uh, so many black men, it, 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 it would make a fool believe that only black men committed crime, right? But that's not the case. And to answer the young lady's question who, uh, was 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 talking about the uh, the you know the the law library and stuff like that. I am actually developing um, a, a packet, uh, and I'm going to disseminate it across different uh, correctional institutions and stuff like that. And because I get inquiries all the time, well, like how do you do this? How does someone do, do that? And and I want to be able to write down what it, exactly I did um, to get help. And one of the things I did was I created a, a template letter. Well, I left the date and left the name uh, blank. 
And I was sending out 30 to 50 letters to the same people uh, every week. Uh, I figured that even if you responded and told me stop writing you, um, you would respond, right? And so it, it's certain tricks and stuff like that. And I just utilize the things that were around, but on the outside now, I understand that it is a lot more difficult to expect people in the condition of prison to have access to even know uh, of these resources and stuff like that. So uh, again, this is, this is very much so a, a part of my coming out party. You're gonna see a whole lot of, of, of the stuff that I'm doing and trying to help. And the fact that uh, this young woman is doing it as a Soros fellow yeah. means that you're gonna be building something. So yeah. I think that um, we'll That's make sure amazing. that we can get collectively information to you um, so as you build your project. Um, I can. I know Angeline's a stickler for time, so why don't we put? We'll put all three questions on the table right. for the panel, and then we'll yeah. turn to the panel. My name is Susan Burton. I'm founder of a New Way of Life Reentry Project, and um, uh, Serena, I don't do lines either, but I just was compelled to stand here to say to all three of you, to all four of you, thank you so much for this panel and for staying the course. You know, I do reentry work, I do reentry work with women, and there hasn't been much mention of women, and women are the fastest growing segment of the prison system. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to get your thoughts about uh, the growth of women in prison and the need for reentry. Uh, uh, programs. I, I'm, I've just been invited back to Cook. That place was uh, Cook County Jail. Yeah, oh, I know yeah. what. It's only it was one breathtaking. Cook. <laughs> uh, yeah. Walking in there, the magnitude of that, and yeah. I went went in there with women. I've been invited back, but what about the women? Yeah, Margie. My name is Margie Love. Um, I was moved to jump up when Serena talked about feeling shame. Um, for 10 years, I ran the pardon program in the Justice Department, and for the past 20, uh, since flunking out of that job in 1997, um, I have represented people seeking pardon. And I, I know that you received a pardon, Serena, from President Obama. Uh, and I really wanted to ask you, uh, because I am so interested, and in all of you talked about this sort of lingering trauma of the conviction and, and the prison experience and the shame. And so many of my clients come to me. They are successful business people. They have long past 20, 30 years sometimes past their conviction. They have a lingering sense of shame. They want to close the books. They want to end that chapter. Um, and, and first, I really want to ask Serena whether the pardon made a difference to her. And second, I, I want to ask the three of you whether there are ways to end that experience, to put a kind of, uh, I think Nora Diemleitner has talked about a celebration of the end of the experience, a formal celebration. Uh, I know you have that in drug court, different accountability courts. Why can't it be for the experience through the criminal justice system generally? And the federal pardon system has fallen on very hard times. But I am determined before, before I check out of this place mm -hmm. that it's going to be fixed. So anyway, that's a little bit of a long question. But Serena, I'd really like to know whether the pardon made a difference. No, that's you. Okay. So um, first with Ms. Burton, thank you for being here. And I cannot wait to speak with you after the conference. Um, I think that there needs to be more uh, rehabilitation, more re-entry programs for women. I feel like women oftentimes, and I'm not excluding men, but they are the nucleus in the center of the family. And I'm saying that because of my experience in prison. Anytime I was in a visiting room and it was time to leave, it was gut-wrenching because you would have children literally hanging on to their mothers. Um, and I think that there needs to be more work done. I'm open to any ideas and willing to work with anything with regard to women and reentry. Um, and maybe we can put our heads together after the conference to talk about some things like that and figure out where we can find resources to do that, not just in each state, but across the country. Um, 
<laughs> and um, just to answer Margie's question, I feel like it did make a difference to me with regard to the pardon I received from President Obama. What I'll say is, first of all, I'm extremely, I feel blessed and honored that I received a commutation and a pardon. One, the commutation from President Clinton and then the pardon from President Obama. I don't feel like one means more than the other. Um, what I feel like is the commutation represented my freedom, and I feel like the pardon represented legitimacy for me. I feel like um, I can't say that the pardon wasn't special for me because I'm a black woman and receiving that from the first black president meant a lot to me. Um, but I feel like it was the legitimacy that said, we get you, you received the commutation and you got out and did what we expected you to do with that second chance and that commutation. And for me, that was the redemption. And so that's sort of how I feel about the whole commutation pardon process. But again, just like Sean has said and Jared, everybody's story is not Serena, Sean, and Jared. And that's why it is important. And Margie, I know you've been in this fight for a long time, um, as well as Ms. Burton. Um, it is our duty and our obligation to continue to be the voice for the people who were formerly, I mean, people who are still incarcerated. And like I mentioned earlier, when I left prison and all of the women in the prison were standing in the yard and they saw me off, to me, I felt like this is my job and this is going to be my obligation to be a voice for them and other people. And I felt like the blessing came for me when I was working at the public defender's office because I was able to feel like I was giving back to people who sat in those same seats that I sat in and Sean sat in and Jared sat in. Um, but I definitely feel like the pardon, it just legitimized everything for me, so. It's, it's interesting because we all sit here and everybody has different feelings. Margie actually reached out to me several years ago when President Obama was doing the pardons and commutations and said, Sean, I'll represent you pro bono. Let's get you a pardon. And the weird thing is, I, I have this overwhelming sense of guilt for all the people I've left behind. And I just told Margie today, part of the reason why I didn't take her up on the offer is, I kind of feel like this is my cross to bear for a while. And, you know, as a white man who's working at Georgetown Law School, it doesn't impact me in the same way it does other people. And so, you know, and again, as Google, as Jarrett said about Google, even if I got the pardon, it's not like nobody is going to know that I robbed those banks. Mm -hmm. And so I feel guilty about that all the time. But I do think it's important for people to get out and feel like they can get their rights back and vote. And not, you know, we, we have this word returning citizen, but that's kind of a misnomer. Nobody coming out of prison is a full citizen. Uh, and that's what we're working towards. And we need more clemencies and more pardons to make people feel whole. Uh, and I'm hopeful that Margie and I will somehow get this system fixed someday and we will have two or 3,000 clemencies and it won't be news when the president issues a commutation or a pardon because they'll be doing it all the time. Uh, and, I, and I, you know, I most certainly am mindful of, of incarceration rate of, of women because I have a, um, a couple of women clients. And uh, <laughs> it's funny because I just visited uh, uh, one of my clients and uh, uh, everyone in the pod was like, man, your lawyer look like John Legend. <laughs> I was like, man, these ladies are something else. But I, I'm mindful. And it, you know, you know the, the, the sad part about it is, is that um, you just look at the, you just, you just, the criminal justice system, if it runs out of certain people, it's gonna move on to the next set of folks. And it's all about resources and there's two sides of justice. One where you can afford it and the other where you can't. And it takes advantage of the people who can't afford it. And so I, you know, these two in particular clients are nonviolent drug offenders on the phone with their boyfriend, say, yeah, I'm gonna pick this up. All of a sudden they got a mandatory minimum of, of 180 months just doesn't make any sense at all. So I'm, I'm most certainly mindful of that. And I know that, that it has to be more difficult for women to reintegrate um, back into to society if they have kids. That, that has to be, you know, uh, you know, horrible. And I'm, I'm always open and receptive to any way I can help uh, to, to anything reentry. So uh, reach, reach out to me. 
I'm, I'm being conscious of the time, but briefly, um, I've had friends who served seven, eight years, got out. They had, you know, one of my friends, she had three sons, lived in Arizona, could not find housing anywhere because she was a convicted felon. And those are some of the things that we're talking about when we talk about collateral consequences. We're talking about barriers to employment and education and housing and licensing. I got another friend who, her job, she created a business to help high functioning adults, but she cannot get licensed in the state of California to continue with that business. And so when we think about collateral consequences, to me what it says is permanent punishment. It That's says exactly that I've paid my debt to society, yet I still have to come home and I have to pay for that crime time and time and time again. And it goes back to, we've been blessed to have these stories and these stories have to be told for a reason. And to answer you, Margie, Sometimes, at least for me, being able to throw off the shame came from people talking to me saying, yes, go do this speech, go be a part of this panel so that I could slowly bring my two selves together because that's how I felt. I felt like there was the public Serena mm -hmm. and there was the private Serena, right? And so in thinking about collateral consequences, I think it's hugely important for us to be able to change the minds of people in society overall because they have to start viewing people with convictions in a different light because if you don't then we'll constantly be that second-class citizen that gets oh he has a conviction or she has a conviction I'll look at this person not look at that and and that's why banning the box and doing the the voter um, restoration and all of those things are extremely important but just to mention all of those things about collateral consequences and thinking about women and men who have children who are trying to get back out and everybody's been incarcerated for these lengthy time periods and they've been parenting from behind bars to the best of their ability. So then you lose a whole another generation of children who have been without their parents despite whatever the choices were that the parents made. So anyway, just thinking about reentry and collateral consequences. So we need to wrap here, but Desmond Mead said so powerfully this morning that he thought that just involved individuals, people who had direct experience were best positioned to make change in this country. And I think we see it up here on this panel. So please join me in thanking them.